All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Radical Canter Podcast. I'm Kim Scott. And I'm Jason Rosoff. Amy's out today. So Kim and I are going to discuss something that's been making the rounds in the news. How to be around other people at work. Resume Builder conducted a survey in 2023 that found six in 10 employers plan to send their employees to, quote, office etiquette training in 2024. (laughs) Whether it's folks returning to the office after years of working remotely or recent college grads without office experience, apparently people just don't know how to act around one another anymore. What do you think, Kim? I think it's true. I was just talking to uh, a leader who I really adore, and she was telling me that once people came back into work, they would kind of behave in person the same way they did on Zoom. But on Zoom, at least, they could put their video on mute. So she said they'd be in a meeting and someone was presenting and people would just stand up in the middle of the presentation, walk out of the room. They would bring in stuff to eat and crunch, 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 crunch. Uh, They just, they didn't, they forgot about how, and you know, etiquette, I think is the wrong word. It's, it's really, I think about respect, how to, how to be respectful of one another in the, in the workplace. Um, I am anti-etiquette, as you can imagine, but I'm pro-respect. This pattern extends beyond the office. There's like a whole bunch of ways in which the world is making it less likely that you have to interact with another person in order to accomplish things that for millennia, human beings have been interacting to accomplish. So buying things, for example, right? There are these, you know, mega retailers online And you never have to interact with a person unless something goes horribly wrong. And then you're often interacting with a person who can't necessarily help you because customer service for these like mega retailers is so bad. And so I I think people go out into the world uh, already sort of suspicious of (laughs) of the people around them and not feeling like they, they need to respect, uh, that respect is like the most important thing. There's another trend, which is was on the rise for the last couple of years, which is these self-checkouts at grocery stores, especially yes. like, uh, and retailers. And I just read an article recently that a lot of companies are reversing course on these things because people are either intentionally or unintentionally walking out of these stores with merchandise that they did not purchase. And, yeah. And... One of the things that they found in the research that I found so fascinating is that people's attitude is that, well, the people who own the store must not care because they're not (laughs) even, there's not even a person here to to help me. So they must not care very much whether or not I pay for for everything that I put in my cart. And anyway, I guess what I'm saying is that if that is the world, it must be very strange for some people especially people who started their career during the pandemic to like come to an office. It must feel like a very weird experience. I have some, I have some uh, compassion for people who are struggling with it. Yeah. I was, I took my dog bear for a walk the other day with a friend and it was in this big uh, open space preserve. So hundreds of acres and you're not, so to be fair to the story I'm about to tell about this person who didn't know how to behave, I had done something wrong, which is I always take my dog off the leash because hmm. he's a very, you know, friendly dog. He's, he doesn't jump up on people and he stays on the path. So I felt entitled to break the rules, which was part of the problem probably. So anyway, there's a person way up ahead and my dog runs up to this uh, with their dog on a leash. And my, my dog runs up to them to sort of sniff their dog and say hello. So I run after and I said, he starts yelling at me, this guy. And so I'm like prepared to be yelled at because I've broken the rules. And so I said to Bear, I said, sit, Bear. And Bear sat because now I know how to teach a dog to do that <laughs> right away. <laughs> and, and I said, oh, good boy, Bear. Good dog. And the man was like, bad dog. <laughs> and I was like, yep. did that like, and I was in the wrong to a certain extent. So I didn't all, I, I thought about a lot of things to respond and I didn't say anything. But what I was thinking, of course, was like, what is wrong with all of us? Like, really? <laughs> It's a sunny day. It's beautiful. There's open space. This dog is full of joy. Like, yeah. what is going on? 
yeah, bad no, no, dog. Yeah, <laughs> and no, I was like, nothing bad had actually <laughs> happened. Yeah, no, no, nothing. But I at think all. I mean, I had broken the rules, which some people. I mean, I think breaking the rules sometimes is a good thing, but other people have different opinions on that, which I respect. That story speaks to the defensiveness that I think a lot of people feel right right now, or the sort of like arm's length thing that that they feel toward other people that they encounter. The the story of the le- like le- to leash or not to leash. Like I, I'm always uh, when I was growing up, I had I had dogs that were fine. They were fine off the leash. You know, like they they'd be totally fine yeah. off the leash. But for the last 16 years of my life, I had a dog who was like a terrorist. So she was, she was not fine off the leash. <laughs> not fine off the leash. I mean, she was, she was nine pounds. Um, and you know, we would be walking by these like, you know, scary looking, um, you know, uh, you know, bull terrier, Staffordshire terrier mixes. And I'm like picking up my dog and the other person's like, Oh no, no, my dog is friendly. It's totally fine. And I was like, yeah, your dog's not the problem. <laughs> It's yeah. this nine pound terrorist that yes. I'm carrying around. That is actually the problem. Like yeah. she, she would. And, uh, anyway, I, one of my favorite stories, Phoebe was, was my dog's name. One of my favorite stories about, about Phoebe is that, uh, I had a friend watching her and we, we prepared him. We said, you know, she's really aggressive on the leash and she's easy to control because she's only nine pounds, but just be ready. And he was like, doing something, he like took her to the park and he was like doing something on his phone and he didn't realize like this other dog was like walking by on a leash. Oh. By the time he realized what was happening, she was on one of those retractable leashes, which is a terrible idea. We should have given her like a, a fixed length leash. Yeah. She had done, it was like the scene in Star Wars <laughs> where the uh, the TIE fighter does like a 360 around yeah. the ATAT's legs and then she dove through and it cinched the dog's legs and like a <laughs> like a, a an animal being downed in the in, in like a in a chase uh it like fell over and the dog is flopping around and she's snarling at the dog and and I will say like the person was pretty good humored about it um but it like took them time to like unwind this this whole situation yeah. and and so it's so interesting now we, we have, uh, she, she passed away a couple of years ago and now we have a new dog, Jack, and he's like so friendly. And I actually had a friend of mine say, I could never have a dog like Jack. I have so much sort of social anxiety that he's so friendly. He wants to greet everybody. Like it would stress me out to have a dog yeah. like Jack because he's like, always yeah. like, can I meet you? Can I sniff yeah. you? Can I sniff your and dog? You can I say hi? with the people. It, 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 exactly. But for Jillian and I, it's like, it's really nice. We have this dog who's like, socially more adept than we are and like makes everybody, you know, pretty much everybody happy that, that he meets. Um, and I feel like that's missing in an office. You know what I'm saying? There's no yes. like socially acceptable, like, like intermediary to like get people talking to each other and stuff like that. So it kind of makes sense if you're going, if you're heading back to the office and you, you are either out of practice or ne- have never had the experience of like how to build these sort of like casual connections with people that it would feel awkward. Yeah. Awkward. And also like, let's, let's talk about different scenarios. So let's imagine you're going back in person to an open office. So nobody Mm -hmm. has offices. Nobody even has cubes. Like everybody can see everybody. Everybody can hear everybody. And I could imagine in that situation that someone would behave like that man in the park where the cheerful person who comes bounding in and hello, and they're like, Shut up. I'm trying to work. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh and so what is like what 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 are the right ways to show respect in that situation? My my sister and I shared a room growing up. And when I am trying to concentrate on something, which it's hard for me to concentrate often, I really can't have any distractions. No noise, no. But my sister who is you know better at focusing than I am, could listen to music. And and we had this very strict rule by the end of high school, which was one, making the noise goes out. <laughs> and as, as soon as, if I got a phone call, she would bark at me, one, making the noise goes out. And if I could hear her music, I would bark at her, one, making the noise goes out. And it was, you know, maybe not the friendliest rule, but we both respected the rule. And so it was, it, that helped us keep the peace while we were sharing a room. Yeah, I think the in, in my mind the the best way to 
to show respect in, in the situ- in the situation of an open office is to have is to have a set of norms for the sp- for each of the spaces. Um, yeah. So it, I think it's okay to have quiet spaces and it's okay to have noisy spaces, but people should know which places are quiet and which spaces yeah. are noisy. So like uh, we had an open office at, at Khan Academy and it, to some extent, some amount of noise is unavoidable, right? And yeah. so for the people who are very sensitive to noise, we, we bought them noise canceling headphones. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we said, you know, we're going to help, minim- we're going to minimize the impact of this. And that was like a pretty easy way. I mean, it's, it's pretty inexpensive. Like you can get a good pair of noise canceling headphones for a hundred dollars now. Like it doesn't cost a lot to create, to accommodate someone who is very sensitive to noise and interruptions anymore. Um, but then we had, uh, you know, we, we did not allow people to impose their desire for quiet in like the cafeteria area, for example. You yeah. can say, sorry, I'm working here. You all have to be quiet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, you had to expect noise in the cafeteria. Correct, but I, I think that that's part of the issue is, is that um, if you don't share your expectations, if you don't share the, the sort of like norms that that you have for how to conduct yourself in in the space, I feel like you're essentially creating chaos that that, that is going to lead to conflict. And so yeah. it, it's sort of interesting to me this idea of like sending people to training probably won't work. Because people yeah. will still come back and not know, like, what exactly is expected of me what, in yeah. this situation, right? Yeah. In this part of the office is like, is it okay to go get up in the middle of a presentation to get something to eat? Like, maybe that's a norm in the, maybe that's okay in your office, but it's not okay in somebody else's office. And then, and, and the general How rules do, of yeah. politeness aren't going to solve that. Yeah, yeah. And so I think this is where the impromptu two-minute feedback conversation <laughs> comes in. So what I said to my friend is you got you got to talk to people, you know, and, and yeah. you, because I think that like a list of rules, if you have some rebels on your team, people will break the rules. So I don't think that that, you know, some people and then other people won't break the rules and then they'll be mad at each other. So I think often, you know, rules uh, sort of set set things up for conflict as well or can. But I think norms are different. So saying to someone, you know, when I have a meeting and someone is presenting, I'd like to ask you not to leave in the middle of the presentation next time. Like most people, even though I'm the rebel who is going to take my dog off the leash in the place where that's the rule not to do that, and I know it, uh, I would respect that request, you know? So I think that's why norms feel very different than rules. Because rules are kind of like, to me, they're 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 made to accommodate every situation, and often they make no sense by the time they've been passed. Whereas norms, you can discuss them. There are going to be exceptions to norms. I don't know. What do you think about that? Or maybe I just need to learn how to follow the rules better. I would only say that I think it, to some extent you're making a semantic argument, but I think it's important in this case because, to your point people perceive rules in different ways. And I think it is very rare for a rule to be something that is up for discussion, but it is, it is not rare for a norm to be something that's up for discussion if information presents itself. And I think the point that you're making is that showing respect is not something that you can codify into rules because maybe you encounter someone who, whose needs are different than what the rule consider, you know, what the people who made the rule were taking into consideration. And then all of a sudden you have this thing that makes no sense because you're like, well, how do we, the situation is totally not, not predicted in the rule book. Correct. Like for, for example, we had to come up with some norms around, um, you know, people bringing bicycles into the office because a lot of people lived close enough that they could ride a bicycle to the office. And we're like, we don't know exactly where to put them. People worried about them getting stolen. Like there's a whole thing. And then people were like, oh, okay, like they were just rolling their bicycles like to to their to their desk, which tracked mud and all this other stuff in. But yeah. if we said, you know, you can't bring anything outside into the office, well, would we say the same thing about a stroller? No, strollers probably fine. 
But, but there won't but be as many of them. <laughs> right. So, so the rule wouldn't have made sense. But instead, what we said was, you know, uh, be mindful if you're going to bring, bring something into the office um, that there are, pla- like, there are places for stuff that comes from the outside. So we had a spot for stroller parking and for bicycles and stuff like that. And it, again, it didn't cost us very much to set up the norm. Uh, and then someone still was like, you know, I'm really worried that my bike is going to get stolen down there. Um, and they brought their bike into the office and we weren't like two demerits for you. We were like, oh, let's have a conversation. Like, can we resolve, like, can we resolve this in another way? Well, what about messiness? I am a person who really has a messy desk and I tend to eat while I work and drink while I work. And I often don't carry my, <laughs> until it's a catastrophically bad, like it piles up for a little while. So uh, so what do you, I think Brandy, I'm guessing you have a thought about this from your expression. Well, I was wondering if I should jump in or not, but Kim, you're probably my worst nightmare as a, as a desk person. <laughs> only if we have, only if there was a hot desk rule enabled, which I hate hot desks, which is where all desks for up for grabs and you can sit in a different desk yeah. every day. Wow. I would rather not work there. I would probably have to resign because People are gross. Yeah. Other people's detritus and food in the keyboard or fingerprints on things. I just, it takes me to a place of not being able to function. And that's me. And I understand that. But I feel like for people like me, there should be a fixed desk area if there's not a cleaner coming in every night and sanitizing everything. Yes. I think people should, here, I'm going to show you right now my desk. Oops, I can't turn this thing around. I, can't I don't mind the mess. You. I don't like food and like hair and dust on yeah. the computer yeah. or the I desk. Yeah, I don't like hair and dust. I don't mind a coffee cup with a little <laughs> coffee the, at the bottom. Or the, the ring at the bottom, yeah. I, I think it's how many days has it been there? Oh, n- not more than two. If, if, it, if I can smell it, I get rid of it. Um, and I have a very sensitive nose, but, but I'm not saying that should be, every, should be the it rule for like, everybody. Yeah. Yes. It probably would not meet Randy, your standards for cleanliness. I mean, I even have, you know, Amy's handed me her iPad before and I'm like, I need to wipe it off first because I can see every <laughs> fingerprint from the last two years on here. And I just start. Yeah. Yes. Well, you're right about that. They say, they say that uh, your average iPhone has more germs than Dirtier your average than a toilet. toilet seat. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I, I think from an, from an office perspective, if you're going to have a norm around cleanliness, there should be a, there should be a reason. It shouldn't just be because some people like things clean and some people don't. Um, COVID, there's a reason. The, the flu. <laughs> yeah. Here's what I would say. I think the... If you have assigned desks, I think there should be a re- there should be a valid reason why you're ta- you're saying you must have your desk be in a, a certain a certain way. Like I I, I really feel like, um, you know, creating a health or sa- like sanitary issue it is a reasonable norm to say like if, if it is like, you know, a toxic waste reclamation site. If your desk has become you know, the equivalent of like a battery factory that has been decommissioned because it's so gross and, uh, you know, overrun with, with guard, the fine. Uh, but again, these are, these are norms. It's not like a rule where you can't have more than three items on your desk at any given time. I feel like those things fail. Whereas norms of like, keep your desk, uh, you know, clean of trash, um, or something like that. Um, like we don't have trash around that, that seems like a a reasonable norm. Or even at the gym, I haven't been to a gym in 10 years. I'm going to date myself here. Back when I used to belong to a gym, you have to wipe the equipment down after each use. So that, you know, at the end of the day, you should wipe your desk down if it's a hot desk. Yes. You're supposed to because you're sweating your gross bodily fluids and other people are going to touch it. (laughs) <laughs> I think what I think what we are doing right now is making the case for remote work because we work right. together very peacefully. <laughs> and I think if we were all in the same open office area, we might, you know, we, maybe it would be positive conflict. Yes. I, I mean, a- and I developed these things from work years of working in offices. I didn't I wasn't yeah. born this yeah. way. I didn't yeah. go through school. You know, in school you sat at a different desk in every class, but it was at working with people who 
I found to have unsavory habits that made brought me to this place. Yeah. Radio was horrifically bad in this sense because you're in there 24-7, oh, I bet 365. It gets stinky, stinky, stinky. Like you share everything, yeah. microphones, a lot of buttons to touch. Ugh. And yeah. it is not the healthiest of lifestyles. Everyone yeah, must have been sick all the time. The Dude. I and I was I became religious about wiping stuff down with uh, like alcohol wipes or whatever. Mm-hmm. And people thought it was odd that I did it. <laughs> and so now that so I'm going through I'm reliving all of these horrors <laughs> and now I work from home and it's just like I can feel the anxiety just leaving my body. It's yeah. the best. So here here's the thing. Like open office plans, like the only reason they exist is to save companies money. That is the only that is the only thing they have going for them is that they're cheaper to build than than traditional offices. There was a claim made early on in the open office movement that it was somehow more efficient, ideas passed more effectively from person to person, all this other stuff. The only thing that passes more effectively from person to person in open office is germs. That's it. That is the only and thing annoyance. that's success. <laughs> annoyance maybe goes even faster than germs. <laughs> um, so we but, have, I think go ahead, Kim. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. Finish it okay. and I'll say. Um, so I I was a big proponent of open offices. And the reason why I was, uh, was not cost. But I, early in my career, had an office with no window. And I I really went into a deep depression in the office with no window. And, uh, and so for me, one of the things that's really important in order to, to feel good at work is a big window and not everybody can have a big window. So it felt Mm. somehow more egalitarian. I mean, and now I have a really big window in my (laughs) home office. Uh, and so that, um, again, like everybody that like work, being in an environment where you can work and where you can feel happy working is really important. And I, I'm guessing working from home is going to optimize for that more than in any kind of office environment. For some people, I think there are, I, I've talked to a number of people in the relative recent past who've said, you know, I've really enjoyed the return to the office. Like I was finding it really yeah. hard to focus on stuff at home. Um, yeah. Like uh, th- that I, I like my work. And I found that I wasn't able to sort of get into the flow that I'm able to get into in the office. What I, The yeah. reason I was making those comments about the open office is because when people have private spaces, you don't have to worry as much about norm setting in the office yeah. mm-hmm. because yeah. people can control their environment more. It is crucial that if you are going back to the office and you have people who have never worked for you, that you are clear with them what those norms are because they they it's it's not like people just know this stuff the way it was learned before is like for the first couple of weeks you're sort of looking around and seeing how other people behave but in the return to the office world you're just sort of like dumped in there with a bunch of people who have no idea what's going on <laughs> they have no idea how to behave or what's expected and so it's just yeah. like pure chaos ensues so i think like the best way to show respect is to create some norms and then i i think the the to ensure that norms remain respectful is to not treat them like laws or rules, but to, sh- to demonstrate openness to changing norms in order to accommodate the different things that people need in order to feel like they can work in that space. And I think when you create those norms, you do not dictate those norms. You need to right. have discussion. One of, the, yeah. one of the least popular things I ever did was I was uh, this was at Juice Software, and we had one big open sort of loft area in which there were desks. And uh, we had hired a bunch of new people. And so we needed, to, we needed to figure out who was at which. Everybody had their own desk, but they needed to be reconfigured. I don't know why. And there was like, for a whole week, there was endless discussion about who, as far as I could tell, who was going to sit next to whom. And, uh, and <laughs> I finally just got fed up with it. And I went in on Sunday and I just put names on. I just, <laughs> I, I was the CEO, and so I said who was going to sit where. And the, it, chaos. I mean, such a rebellion. Like, <laughs> and one of the one of the, it was one like of the, mutiny on a pirate ship. Oh They're my gosh! I, I was going to be thrown out the window. And one of the one of the guys who was, you know, 
much younger than I was, early in his career, he sat me down and he explained exactly why I had done such a bad thing. And it made a lot of sense to me. It was like, oh, you know, he said, look, it, it matters to everybody. And we were going through a process, maybe it seemed inefficient to you, but where, you know, where you sit and, and like some people really cared about a window, everybody cared about different things. And it took a while to figure out how to optimize. Like some people didn't mind noise and those people could be near the kitchen area. Some people really did mind noise and they needed to be at the other end. And, and it took a while to like, figure that out. And we needed to have discussion. Like you could never have figured out all these little details and you just ignored what everybody needed. Um, And so don't do that. If you're a manager, don't make that mistake about your open office. Like let people set norms, let your team set norms. Your job as the leader is to create a space for conversation for them to figure out what those norms are. Yeah. And I would say the other role that you have as a leader is to recognize that you there's no set of norms that's going to make everybody happy all the time. And that's okay. Like it it is okay. Like there's going to be some disagreement and some conflict that comes about as a result of this. Like that's just part of happy, uh, of having uh, an undefined space, like, like an, like an open office. And the way to resolve that is not by, you know, making rules and punishing people, but by having real human conversation. And, and encouraging them to talk. Like if somebody comes and talk, I mean, it's the clean escalation thing. If someone comes and talks to you, someone comes and complains to you about Kim's messy desk, ask them to come talk to me directly, you know? Yeah. Don't, uh, don't, don't come talk to me. Cause then I'm like, Oh, Brandy talked to my boss about my messy desk. And now I'm mad at Brandy. Whereas if Brandy came and talked to me herself, we would probably be able to work it out. This is not the most complicated thing in the world. I mean, as long as I didn't have to touch your keyboard, you can do whatever you want at your desk. It's just when I was forced <laughs> to interact with other people's <laughs> items yeah, that yeah, had yeah. been in this like biohazard that, or it, like it, it all started from an IT guy who was just always like covered in Doritos or something and would come over and be like, let me do something and would be banging on your keyboard and then everything would be gross. Yeah. You could literally dump his keyboard upside down and like everything would fall out Trumps. of it. That's where, that's where I got this. <laughs> proclivity yep. from i'm yep. gonna send you a little computer cleaning set that i got it's got like this air gun you can oh, and yeah, all the crumbs <laughs> part of the challenge that people are facing is this sort of like is not just what happens in office but um and this is definitely a challenge we had at khan academy but like the the sort of hybrid world of, of offices. Yeah. So now you have like, let's say you've been successful at setting a set of norms for your open office. You still, you probably are still running into issues where the norms of like what uh, the uh, sort of norms around remote work versus hybrid uh, teams, that can also be really challenging. One of the things that we ran into early on uh, at Khan Academy was that the People who were working remotely uh, in the in the hybrid situation, we had some people in the office and some people remote. People who were wor- working remotely often had a really really hard time of contributing to conversations where there was a part of the team was in the room and a part of the team was remote. And so we actually had to create some uh, some norms around how to share airtime in those meetings and how ha- and making sure that you're checking in with the people who are remote because. It doesn't seem like a lot, but one of the reasons why we talk over each other on Zoom or whatever the you know video chat is there's a tiny amount of latency. And when you're in person, you can notice that someone has not actually paused. Uh, they, they are continuing a thought. But because of that latency, it can, they can extend that pause and you sort of be, you jump in and, and interrupt them. And that was happening quite a lot to the people who were remote. So they were asking us, hey, can we create some norms around how to deal with, especially meetings or conversations where a preponderance of people are physically together in the room and only some people are remote, as an example. Yeah, it's like another bias. There's a bias for the people who are physically in the room with you to listen to them more than the people who are on the screen. Yep. The other thing is like people in an, people in an office setting, when you're all remote, you're very sensitive to things like what time zone people are in and things like that. You're sort of aware of like the different ways and and times that people work. But if you're 
in the office and the preponderance of people around you are working in the same time as you, it's easy to assume that other people, even though they're remote, are working the same <laughs> the, the same time zone as you. And so this idea of trying to find ways of making visible the things that might be invisible. So we actually had like a team, we 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 had kind of, they were kind of like tiger teams. Um, we spun up project teams and spun them down fairly frequently. And we wound up creating a playbook for teams as they were forming of like, here are some really good things to talk about of like, how do I use various communication tools? Are we an email team? Are we a Slack team? You know what I'm saying? Are we a video call uh, first team? Like, h- how are we going to communicate time zones and work preferences? Like, when do I work? Uh, because just because someone's in a different time zone doesn't necessarily like we had some people who were on East Coast time but preferred to work West Coast hours. So they yeah. would start work at 9 a.m. West Coast time or noon East Coast time and work until 8 p.m. That was their preference. Uh, and so time zone alone isn't going to tell you very much. But think about building a, a checklist for teams of good, like good things to discuss building norms around. Um, yeah, I think what, in, what do you in, think about that? I think that's really a great idea. And I I also think if you're working with a global team, obviously you're going to be hybrid because you're not all in the same place. But it is really tricky to to find a time (laughs) that is convenient around the whole world. And one of the things that, that we did on my team at Google was we would have Diff, two of three time zones would meet, which meant that one third of the time I couldn't attend my own staff meeting unless I wanted to wake up at three in the morning, which I did not. And uh, and and sort of letting go of, of control, it gave people good leadership opportunity. So someone else, one third of the time, had to lead my own staff meeting. Uh, and uh, and so I think you can do things like that, like get pretty get radical in how you're going to yeah. manage time zones. But, um, and, and one of the things that you shouldn't do is, uh, is require that people get up in the middle of the night, uh, to, to attend a meeting. Yeah. Or at least spread the pain around. Like uh, so, sometimes it's like actually required, but one of the things yeah. that can really easily happen is that one time zone in particular gets the short end of the stick. You know what I'm saying? Draws yes. the short yeah. straw, like every, every time. Yeah. Um, we definitely had some like operations type meetings and stuff like that, where it was really important for everybody to be on. And we wanted to make sure that sometimes that happened late at night or early in the morning for the people who were in the home time zone of the company, not, not always for the people who are remote. And when I couldn't, there was a period of time that I couldn't travel because I was pregnant with twins and then I had them. And in that period of time, what I did was I would work one week per quarter on Europe time. And I would work one week per quarter on Asia time. And that, you know, that meant I was in the office at some weird hours, but it was way better than travel. I mean, it was possible for one thing, but even, even after it was more possible for me to travel, I preferred to do that than to travel. And that gave me enough overlap time that I could really get you know, get on their right time zone and like attend their their meetings virtually. Another thing that we did that didn't work, and I wonder if listeners maybe have some advice about how to make this work, is we set up these video cameras in the break rooms all around the world so that you could have these, ad, you know, right by the coffee machine. So if you're going to make coffee or pour yourself a cup of coffee, someone else was Never really worked. People didn't really ever have chit chats that way. But it it would be interesting to figure out a way to try to recreate the ad hoc, you know, walk by someone and say hello kind of situation. Yeah, we we tried something very similar. We had like some of those remote presence uh, robots. So there are like iPads on. Oh wheels. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> they they were like very. I mean. It was very uncanny valley or something. Co- correct. It was, it was more humorous than it was helpful. Um, yeah. There's yeah. a whole episode of The Good sense. Wife about that. Sorry to interrupt, but it's <laughs> no, <that's> very okay. <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it was, not only was it uncanny valley, but the things would like get stuck on things and like someone would be like <laughs> facing a wall and not able to yeah. get out. Like it was, there yeah. was so many. Um, so I, I've never figured that out. But what one thing we did do was um, we did like a 15 minute tea time. So if 
mm-hmm. you would know like, and, and then we would set up, uh, you could like book a meeting room for 15 minutes for tea time. And anybody who wanted to meet, grab a couple tea, cup of tea and head it into the, the meeting room. And th- we purposely made them short um, and, uh, so and really encouraged just- them to be social. So two people or it'd be two teams? Oh, it basically it was, we, we had in the, in the rooms, we had like a, a monitor and a video camera that could see the entire room. Uh, and mm-hmm. basic, and you would book a meeting in the room, which was fi- like a 15 minute tea time. And anybody who was remote could join in oh, and I see everybody see. that was oh, in the room good. and anybody who was there could sit around and grab a cup of tea and, and, and chat with the oh, people. Oh, that's who a cool remotely. idea. Those were really popular especially because, uh, you know, attendance was never, there, there's not mandatory. It's not like a meeting you had to go to. And so people, it wasn't the same thing as walking by someone's desk, but random people would show up. And so you'd wind up talking to different people in, yeah. the, in those meetings. I like that. That's a good idea. We, we've talked a little bit about these two minute impromptu conversations and, and clean escalation, uh, as the sort of like staples of, of radical candor uh, and, how, and how they can help. I think, one of the things that I was reflecting on as we were having this chat was that radical candor in some ways is the exercise of making the implicit explicit, right? Yes. It's like taking the things that are in our head and saying and finding a way to say them to other people in a way that is compassionate, that that, that shows that we yeah. care uh, uh, about them. And I think that to me is like the cru- the crux of the problem is there's a lot of things that are implicit uh on on yeah. both sides right yeah. there's the person who's been remote the whole time implicitly assuming that it's fine to get up and grab something to eat during the middle of the yeah. presentation there's yeah. the person who's been in the office the entire time who has the impl- who implicitly thinks uh that it is okay uh for me to you know, pick up the phone and call this person, even though that might be outside their working hours. Um, yeah. And so uh, almost every piece of advice that we've given could be boiled down to like, don't allow things, try as best you can to make things explicit as opposed to wa- relying on people's implicit understanding of what constitutes good good behavior. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. And part of the problem with implicit understanding is that it's usually uh, an, an <laughs> implicit judgment of the other person. And so it's an implicit misunderstanding. And yeah. if we can just talk. In fact, I think, you know, I've told the story so many times, but but I, I sort of had this moment of realization when we were trying to create a, a, a tool to help people be more radically candid uh, a long time ago that the the whole purpose of radical candor, the whole idea is really to learn how to have conversations with one another. And sometimes technology can get in the way. Sometimes it can facilitate a conversation, but it can just as easily get in the way of a conversation. And so remembering that that's like at a certain point, that's the goal of, of all the advice in radical candor is is to connect, to reach out and talk to each other, um, and and just ask questions. Be curious, like be kind. Uh, it's not uh, at some level it seems so simple, but there's nothing simple about it. I think that the, the this idea, the distinction that we're making between sort of norm bottoms up norm setting versus top down rule making, is, yes. is is also like is the other sort of key thing that 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 is like built on the spirit of, of, of radical candor, which is when we tell people what they need, not only do they often feel, um, the, the, do they feel sort of unseen or, or misunderstood? Um, we also open ourselves, we're creating a situation which is like incredibly rife with, with bias, right? Cause we're often, yes. when we tell other people what to do, it's often because it is what we want to have happen. Uh, yes. and what we want to have happen is, is, fu- is fundamentally a, a biased thing. And so this idea of having conversations, I, I think a lot of people could be listening to this podcast and being like, Oh my God, so inefficient. Can't we just say, these are the five rules and you have to do these things. And the problem is you're going to get those rules wrong. And especially if you're dick, you know, sort of dictating them based on your own perception of what would be helpful, you're opening yourself up to, uh, to a suboptimal set of rules, which people will ignore or break. Um, 
and 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 make them mad at each other, and then you're going to have to sort out all these <laughs> upset feelings. Correct. So it's sort of the like classic be in a ineffi- be inefficient to be efficient, right? Like to yes. have the conversation in order to get to an understanding that actually uh, be more useful, more durable over the long term. Yeah, I mean, if you think about, uh, and I'm sure everyone listening can think of that time when they decided to send the email rather than pick up the phone and call because it seemed faster. And then the email resulted in a major misunderstanding and they had to spend a week undoing it. Or think of my story. I was like, oh, this is taking too long to figure out who's going to sit where. I'm just going to put names on desks. It was that that was like the least efficient thing I could possibly have done. (laughs) That's why telling people what to do doesn't work. So I think I want to leave people with a couple of like very specific tips about radical candor. Uh, to help them have, because it's easy to say have conversations. It's really hard to do it. Uh, One is like at the beginning of a staff meeting, make sure you check in, like go around the table and let people say what's going on for them. Like what are they, what are they having to leave outside the meeting so they can be present in the meeting? And that I think will help us all sort of get to know each other a little bit more. Remember when you're going to have that impromptu two-minute conversation, if you are in person, take a walk. Uh, Remember that you're apt to misunderstand another person's facial expressions or body language. And often you're apt to misunderstand them in a way that reveals bias. Uh, So another good reason to take a walk. And if you're not in person, try the phone, not a video call. So those are a couple of just practical, tactical tips for for using radical candor to rekindle the fine art of conversation. That's great. Should we do some should we do a checklist? Let's do it. It is now time for our radical cha- we mi- we're time. missing Amy. We're missing yes. Amy. Radi- we radical are. Chandler is what I thought you were about to say. That, <laughs> that is exactly what friends. I was about to say. <laughs> um now it is time for our Radical Candor Checklist. Tips you can use to put radical candor into practice to help resolve potential conflicts about workplace norms. Tip number one, don't forget to care personally. You don't have to make it some huge thing. Give people guidance about office respect using an impromptu two-minute conversation. I think there are some things that sort of lend themselves to I can predict everything. Norms are not one of those things. So do little, make little adjustments as you go. But have some is tip number two. It's important to have some norms and to document them, to make the, uh, to make the thinking uh, about uh, those norms public as a way of uh, not as a tool for enforcement, but as a way to invite reflection uh, and uh, encourage people to speak up if changes are on are might be necessary in order to uh, make it easier to work in the office or to work with people remotely. And tip number three: try walking and talking. Whether you're in person or on the phone, walking and talking can be we we process information better when our bodies are moving. So walking and talking. Kim, do you have a favorite thing this week? You know, I just got a new pair of Levi 501 shrink to fit blue jeans. I think that has already been a favorite thing. You already thing. used that one. Yes. No, <laughs> it's your favorite thing every day though. It is my favorite thing. Let me think about my, f- okay. Shall we talk about our favorite things? Yes, I do have a favorite thing. My favorite thing today is my all birds hiking shoes, my orange all birds hiking shoes. They have all kinds of different shoes, but the hiking shoes are especially comfortable. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of all birds. All right. For more tips, you can go to radicalcandor.com slash resources to download our free learning guide, sign up for Radical Candor on Masterclass, get our lit video book, register for our workplace comedy series, The Feedback Loop, and more. That's radicalcandor.com slash resources. To see the show notes for this episode, head to radicalcandor.com slash podcast. Praise in public and private, criticize in private. If you like what you hear, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your Radical Candor podcast. 
If you have criticism for us, please email it to podcast at radicalcandor.com. We do read every single one of those and we appreciate them. Bye for now. Bye, everyone.